Gary Lineker, thanks for joining us. Pleasure. You're here today because of your book. Yes. Tell us about it. Um, well, it's a, it's a book around the podcast that I do with Danny Baker called um, Behind Closed Doors. Um, and it's kind of a lifetime of reminiscences of both Danny as a football fan um, and broadcaster of, of the game and um, myself as a, a footballer and a football fan and a broadcaster of the game as well. So um, a lifetime of um, stories and um, lots of fun. Some great anecdotes that we'll get to. Indeed, of course. We should deal with it straight off. You work with Danny Baker. Now, obviously, he was cut from Five Live recently because when the Duke and Duchess of Sussex had their son, Archie, who's mixed race, he tweeted a photo of a chimpanzee holding hands with a couple. So he was cut from the BBC, but you're still working with him. Why is that? Um, Well, I... If you know Danny, I know Danny very well, obviously, and Danny... Um, used to have a radio show, well he had lots of radio shows, he used to have a radio show where um, the whole thing was basically chimpanzees dressed up in in various forms of clothing. Um, Danny had no idea who, which member of the royal family was having a baby. Um, if you know Danny, you would possibly believe that because he doesn't have, even have a mobile phone so he goes around the end of time he gets tweets and stuff, he's off his computer at home. Um, he, you know, looked for some kind of picture on on the internet um, and found a, I don't know how, but some chimp- chimpanzee in, in baby's clothing. Um, he was trying to have a dig at entitlement, basically, I think, and privilege. Um, um, and he made a mistake. He, he made a massive mistake. So he tweeted this thing um, within seconds, people saying, whoa, Danny, what are you doing? This is, you know, this is racist. He's gone, oh my God. Um, he didn't realise the baby was mixed race. Yeah. Presumably you wouldn't carry on working with him if you thought he was racist. If I thought he was racist in any way, shape or form, I wouldn't be working with Danny. I, and, and if you really think about it, why would he come out as a, so obviously as a racist now? He's 62 years old and, and you know, he's, he's never had any kind of history of that kind of thing before. Um, you couldn't think of a more obviously racist thing to do if you wanted to do it. So it was obviously it was a mistake it was a very big mistake one that he you know he paid dearly for as you said by losing his um, he losing his job with five live and he had a really tough dark summer danny um and he found it very hard and um, um but if i felt as i said i think it was it was a mistake he's he's not a racist clearly the tweet had racist connotations um we all know that but it was it was not deliberate in any way shape or form he cocked up, as we all do in life occasionally. Um, and yeah, and here we are, we, we, we've carried on. So do you think there's consolation then, or he's found therapy perhaps in your podcast and, and the process with you? Um, I don't know. I don't know. That's a, that's a question, yeah. one for him, of, <laughs> of course. Um, sure. But, you know, he's, you know, he's, he's re-emerged, he's, he's back to his old self now. And, Good to uh, hear. And, you know, we know what it's like as well on social media nowadays when there's a kind of big pile on. Absolutely. So, and that's very topical because we were just talking about Laura Kunzberg, for example, yes. one of your BBC colleagues. Mm-hmm. She's been the victim of an online pile on in the last few hours. Perhaps you could explain what's happened to Laura. Um, well, I, I mean, obviously she um, tweeted something yesterday. The guy that confronted Boris Johnson in the hospital um, when Boris said, you know, there's no press and the press were there right side, so, which was obviously the main story. And then I think the story got deflected a little bit. and. Um, Laura tweeted something about him being a social activist or a socialist activist or something, which was, uh, and then people piled on her because people started piling on him, and then she got the blame. And it, it, it's we live in a kind of blame society, and this it's so very tribal at the moment. So people on the right are saying one thing, and people on the left are having to go about a, a, and another thing. So, you know, I felt for a bit this morning because you know you get these things occasionally, um, you know. How many times in life have we written something down that can't be taken in a different context, etc.? So, you know, I, I, it's just kind of a precarious world and the, the world of social media. You've got to be so careful and so thoughtful. And that in itself is, is a lesson for all of us, I think. Yeah, absolutely. And I think a lot of the time the criticism that she gets often isn't fair. And perhaps one wonders why that might be the case. And well, I think we know why that's the case because because we live in very kind of divided times. Um, I mean, Laura obviously does a lot around the Brexit issue and the fact she'll get complaints from both sides of the argument suggests she's, job right. suggests she's doing her job right. And I think she's, you know, she's a brilliant journalist and, and, and it's, it's a really tough time because 
all the people on the Brexit side, all they want to hear about, the positives about Brexit and the negatives about the Remainers, and all the Remainers want to hear is that the, the negatives about Brexit and the positive mm -hmm. about Remainers. And they're looking for it. So as soon as there's some, you know, the BBC might post something positive about Brexit, all the Remainers jump on them. As soon as the BBC um, you know, publicises something that's positive about Remainers, all the Brexiteers get on. So it's like, th that's kind of the world you live in when you work for the for the BBC because of that, you know, that neutrality that they're supposed to keep. So, you know, if you're in the news world in the BBC, that they have my sympathy. I mean, we get it to a lesser degrees in football because football is very tribal as well, but not quite to that <laughs> kind of extent. So, so then let's talk about football. In the book, you talk about your move to Barcelona and initially you talk about living out of a hotel room, tripping, out, tripping over suitcases. Tell us a little bit about that move. Um, well, you know, you, you, you plan your career and you finish, you play in a World Cup in Mexico, you come back, you're suddenly signing for Barcelona, one of the biggest clubs in the world, and I was newly married at the time. And I went out, we travelled out with Michelle, we took basically our life's belongings with us, about 14 suitcases. Um, they told us we were going to stay in the Hotel Presidente. We thought, oh, this is going to be really nice, you know, we'd be probably the penthouse of the whole top floor, it's Barcelona after all. We get there and it's, it's kind of a room that's not much bigger than this little square that we're sat in here. <laughs> and with a, you know, with a double bed and nowhere to put a, a, a bag, so we had to keep them all around. We were scrambling over them to get to, to do stuff. Um, and it wasn't quite like the life I imagined in a, a big club like Barcelona. And then we had to ask for another room, which I had to pay for, um, to put all the luggage in, which was next to it. And then the room past that was Mark Hughes's room. And he'd just arrived <laughs> and we went in to see Mark and we'd be going, what's it? And he's going, well, what's this all about? <laughs> so was, yeah, but, um, yeah, so we were in there for four months and then eventually we got to, to rent a place. But um, yeah, you see, that's, you know, star stuff. I, I don't think the same would happen nowadays, would it, with like Messi or Perhaps Suarez? Not. Perhaps not. I saw a little bit of your uh, Spanish on Match of the Day recently and obviously you enjoyed the language, you enjoyed the place. How beneficial for you as a player and as a person was making that move to Europe? I, I think it, it, it was great for me on, on both fronts. Um, I relished it, I enjoyed it, embraced it. Um, I went to school three times a week for two years um, to learn the language. I thought it was a unique opportunity to do so. Um, and I think if you're happy, if you can, you know, communicate and have a good dialogue with your teammates in their language, then it, it's going to help you because, you know, it, it, it makes you, it kind of gives them a good feeling about you and, and vice versa. So it was, um, it was something that I felt was important because before I went, I'd looked at the players that had been successful abroad and the ones that perhaps hadn't done very well and not lasted very long. And generally speaking, the ones that had been successful, the ones that had embraced the culture and learnt the language, and the ones that had just gone there for a few quid, um, because you have to remember in my time, a lot of players played abroad. And one of the reasons was that the money was so much bigger abroad than it... I know it seems strange now because Premier League's obviously has so much money, but that's how it was. So some of them just went, like, oh, I'll do a year or two and get a few quid and then get back home. Um, and they were ones that didn't didn't fare well, so um, I just got the opposite approach, and it um, I, I thoroughly enjoyed my time there. You said last year that blocking Brexit is more important than football. Do you think that fans have considered or even perhaps realised the impact that this could have on the English game? Well, I didn't quite say blocking Brexit. I think I'm having Sorry, a, it's maybe, paraphrasing. maybe a rethink. Um, <laughs> you know, like, I, I, you know, obviously I'm an advocate of the people's vote. Um, I never thought I would say that when once it was done. To be honest, I was disappointed, but I thought, well, that's it. We've got to, you know, we've got to do what the um, um, the majority said. But um, then it became quite obvious that we were lied to, you know, all over the shop. Nobody mm -hmm. really knew the ramifications of, of Brexit at that point, and and also the, uh, the obviously like illegalities as well. So you know, all in all, then eventually came round to thinking, well. No, no, hang on a minute. Let's let's find out what this really entails, and then let's have a vote. So it wasn't exactly blocking it. Um, what it will mean for football, it, it'll be interesting. I think um, you know, obviously, freedom of movement will affect it. Um, uh, it's hard to know at the moment because we've still not left. Yeah. Whether we ever do, who knows? Um, if we do, you know, freedom of movement will be altered. Um, I would imagine. So footballers from Europe will then need visas to work here, whereas obviously you could just buy anyone from Europe. Mm. Um, whether they'll now follow the 
rules that you have to have when you buy players from non, not from Europe, so they have to have played so many international appearances and that sort of thing. Mm. So that could affect things. In fact, some, I was saying to someone recently, the only positive thing I think might come out of Brexit is that your, our young players might get more opportunities to play because it's not going to be as easy just to sign young kids from Europe mm. um, because they'll probably need the same criteria as, as international players from outside of the um, EU. I was going to ask you whether you thought it would have a beneficial impact on the England yeah. team, and I guess yeah. that's a potential. The only thing is that, that we've got so many good young players coming through and they're starting to get their opportunities, which is, which is encouraging anyway. Um, so, um, but, you know, who knows? It's funny because the Premier League obviously kicked up a bit and said, hang on, we, that, we, we've got to still be allowed to get the European, otherwise we'll have an unfair disadvantage mm. to, the, to the rest of Europe. So they're kicking up a bit of a, a fuss about it. So uh, we don't know until it happens, like in so many things. Do you think there's a, let's call it a contradiction, in fans who, let's say they voted Leave, they voted to win freedom of movement, and then at the same time love the English game, love the excellent European players that play for their teams. Is there, is there not a little bit of a, yeah, a contrast, a contradiction there? Well, I think there'll be contradictions in all sorts of things um, on, on both sides. Um, and, and the true ramifications, whilst they're becoming clearer the closer we possibly get, um, we still don't you know, really know. Um, you know. Originally it was all project fear, now it's well, it won't be that bad. So we'll see. We don't know. You know, we'll, we'll battle on somehow. And, you know, people say, yeah, but we're, you know, and all this stuff, which, which is great. But it's, for me, it's this divide on a nation. Um, you know, it's, I think it's really sad. There's a lot of kind of venom, a lot of hate. Um, you know, I've got Brexit teammates that I, I'll have debates with and arguments, but it doesn't affect our the fact that we still like each other as human beings. And that's the side of it I find tough to, to comprehend. But um, I think the closer we get, the, um, the more we realise perhaps that it's, it's probably quite a damaging thing mm. to do. And it just seems such a shame. For what? <laughs> I'm still waiting to hear one real plus. Yeah. Do you think the English game has benefited then from the influx of foreign European players and managers since 1992? Um, I think definitely. I think um, I think particularly as well as it's been a time where we've not produced enough of our own because we, our development was poor. I mean, it was really poor. Um, it was only about ten years ago that we were still playing seven-year, eight-year-olds up to eleven-year-olds on full-size pitches, um, and people wonder why we have to boot the ball long. Um, so that changed. The, you know, brought in small-sided pitches for kids, and all of a sudden we're producing loads of talent, loads of talent. They're all coming through, and I think it's um, it's really quite exciting. Um, but in that interim period, it was important that we had lots of good players from elsewhere um, to teach us as well about how the game should be played, um, and also the the playing surfaces have improved so much that it's it's given us the chance to play the kind of football that they do in Italy, and Spain, etc. A big difference then from when you were a youngster. The, certainly the playing conditions now. That's the one thing people always talk about, you know, you, you miss playing or, you know, you, you're jealous about the amount of money they earn, etc. Um, I do all right. But, um, but the one thing, the one thing that I look at now with any kind of envy, and it's, it's those beautiful billiard top playing surfaces that they, they perform on, they're so good now. Um, especially for strikers because you get the ball knocked up to you and it used to be bouncing all over the place and coming off your knees and people sh shouting nonsense from the sidelines. And um, yeah, it's the one thing I just think, oh, I'd love to have played on that. I mean, I might have played, you know, the pitches now in January, February are better than the pitches we played on in August. Um, or in a World Cup, I played in Mexico in the World Cup and it was like playing on potato fields. They were so awful, even at the Azteca, it was horrendous, worst pitch ever. Um, but now, everywhere you go, Perfect. No excuses, though, I suppose. Yes, yeah, that's no the downside. Yeah. Something else you mentioned in your book, having dinner with Michael Gove. What's he like to share a risotto with? Um, it wasn't a risotto. It was... Um, <laughs> <laughs> what was it? It was, it was fish and spuds or something. Like it. it was definitely spuds involved. I remember lots of spuds. Um, yeah, it was an interesting one. I mean, it was, um, it was a mutual friend who, and, and a group of people, and he was there trying to... So it's just before Brexit, just before the Brexit vote. Interesting time. And um, yeah, and he was trying to sell it 
sell it to us um, around the table. And he was amiable enough at, at, at that point. But there was a point where I said, hang on a minute, is this not really just about you trying to become Prime Minister? And, he's, and, he, and he just looked, he said, there are no circumstances. No, there are no circumstances that would... And then mm. like, a couple of weeks later, <laughs> hang on a minute, hang on a minute. Um, so anyway, but that's, you know, time... Have you enjoyed his living. company? Yeah, yeah, it was, you know, it was, obviously he's a, he's, a, he's a smart, intelligent bloke, but um, I disagree with his stance on, on Brexit, but, you know. Would you prefer him to Boris? <sighs> I don't know. What's that? I don't know, I don't know. That's I mean, a tough question. I mean, they, they, I mean, obviously the two of them, they kind of um, share the same thing, really, isn't it? Yeah. The devil wouldn't <laughs> say that. <you know? laughs> Some people actually wanted you to be uh, the Prime Minister not too long ago. You beat Ken Clark in a poll of people for a unity government, the longest serving MP in the House of Commons, and people mm. said they wanted you instead of Well, they you. want a fresh face, you see. <laughs> <laughs> no, thanks. I have absolutely zero political ambitions whatsoever. I'm interested in politics, but yeah. I don't want to be involved in politics. In the same way that I'm, I was quite spoken about FIFA, people used to say, saying, why don't you get in there and, you know, get involved in the political aspects of, of football. And I, would, I always said to them, I mean, I'm no interest in that. I mean, boring meetings, shaking people's hands I'm not really interested in and they wouldn't be that interested in me. And it's just a world that, nah, I quite like football. I'm watching it and talking about it and stuff mm -hmm. like that rather than. What is it, what was the event that made you want to start talking about politics, made you want to start talking about FIFA? Well, it was FIFA. I don't, I don't think it's an event that was getting on my nerves for years with the obvious corruption that was going on. I mean, it was, I suppose it was probably the bid, you know, the bid when they went with, obviously, Russia and particularly Qatar, mm. which, come on, they were saying, oh, it's Summer World Cup. I mean, it wasn't even the one against us, really. I just felt, it was like, I think it was Australia and Spain were bidding against them or something. And you thought, Hang on a minute, they've voted for Qatar that's going to be like 50 odd degrees in the summer and they're kind of trying to tell us the outdoor stadiums will be air conditioned. So they worked out it was hot in the summer. Who'd have thought? Um, and so, you know, it was starting to become pretty obvious that there were shenanigans going on. So I started to speak out about it. Um, you know, I'm particularly, I suppose, strong against Blatter. Um, and in the end, I, I, I was proved right on that particular issue. Um, disappointingly in a way um, but so and then you know I don't get involved that much politically I never t tell anyone who I vote for mm. um, I'm, I'm, I'm actually the archetypal floating voter I mean people s assume I'm kind of this massive socialist or something but I'm actually fairly in the middle ground you know I, I, I think as a lot of us are and feel a little bit kind of politically homeless at the moment. Mm. Um, so I, I, I never tell people who I vote for um, the only thing I came out openly about was was um, was the referendum really I just um, it was funny after the the Gove meeting I, I I just thought I need to do some kind of proper research because I don't really I don't really understand it I mm. don't really understand what are the benefits what are, what are the negatives what are the positives etc I didn't so I just thought I did a lot of kind of reading a lot of reading and, and started to think crikey actually this this is quite this could be quite damaging for the country it could be quite a bad thing um, and so that's when I thought, well, I'll come out and say something. I was actually motivated. I was walking through, it was during the Euros um, in, in Paris. And I was walking around and there was, um, there was a statue of Winston Churchill. And I was Googling them to do a picture. I was Googling a bit and it was, it was like so really pro-Europe, you know, the combined thing after the war and all. So, and, I, and I just kind of used that as a um, theme. Um, towards coming out as Remain, and then perhaps I shouldn't have bothered. <laughs> <laughs> tough. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's been perhaps tough. Perhaps I shouldn't since. have bothered. I wasn't going to, you know, I was resisting it, but and in the end I did. One of the, um, on that then, so one of the criticisms that's been levelled at you, perhaps unfairly, is that you're breaching BBC impartiality rules by taking your position. Yeah, so go on, exp explain that. I, I, I'm not in news and current affairs. Those are rules only apply to those in news and current affairs. Um, you know, plus I'm a you know, freelancer, you know, I work for BT Sport, I work for all sorts of different things. Um, so it, they don't apply to me. And I knew that, I've always known that. So, and then, so it's not, it's just never been an issue. As much as football is news and current affairs for a lot of people. Um, so well, it's, it's a different kind, it's not news and current affairs, absolutely. it's sport. <laughs> Thank you for clarifying. Um, were your parents political? Um, my dad was actually a Thatcherite. 
which would surprise some. No, he was a small businessman, you know, in, in Leicester at that time. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I deliberately never asked who he voted for in the referendum. Because <laughs> I suspect I know the answer. Yes, okay. <laughs> but I'll never know. You write very movingly in your book about your father. Yeah. Could you tell us a little bit about that? Um, yeah, I, I'm, I'm, I was always obviously massively close to my dad. He's hugely supportive of my career, he did so much for me. But he wasn't, you know, he wasn't that open about his emotions. Like many of that generation, they, they largely kept stuff to themselves. Um, you know, and the last, you know, he died a couple of years ago now. And, and, and during the last, I don't know, year or two, I was up and down to Leicester all the time. I saw a lot of him. I probably saw more of him. We had more intimate chats than we'd ever had in our lifetime because, I don't know, just spent more time on our own together than we'd ever done before. So, you know, there are a couple of things. The one, he, 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 he told me out of the blue that he'd always thought I'd make it. Um, and, and he'd never said anything like that. Because I, I was always, I had a load of self-doubt growing up. I always used to think I'd get found out at some point. I don't know, that's genuinely the case. And I said, was, you know, you, did it surprise you? And he went, no, I always knew. And I said, well, well, he could have told me. <laughs> he could have told me at some point. He said, well, I just, just, you know. I mean, he was the only bloke probably in the country that backed me to be top scorer in 1986. <laughs> 14 to 1. He had a few quid on, so he was happy. <laughs> And, and the other thing was that, you know, a couple of weeks before um, he, he passed away, he was, he was getting really ill and it was obvious he was going. And he was, he was ready to go. He said, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm OK. I said, I've had enough. I'm, you know, I, you know I, my time's up. I've had a great life. Um, and, and at the end of that conversation, he just, as I was about to walk out, he just said, I, I, I love you. And he'd, he'd, never, he'd never told me that before. And I, it was, I, I was like, crikey, I swear I love you too. And it was, it was kind of an... A weird moment. I know it sounds odd, but my mum always shared her emotions and told me that, but I'd never heard it from my dad before. And I, you know, and it was, um, it was something. I was just glad he lived to see Leicester win the league. <laughs> Honestly, I know that sounds mad, but, you know, he's a massive Leicester fan all his life. We used to have, you know, always chatting. And, and that, that season, the phone call after every time they won, it was like, yeah. And, yeah, so I'm glad he, I'm glad he hung around for that. Gary, a beautiful place to leave it. Thank oh, you. Thank you. Cheers, Mike.